thinking about what the Lord would have us look at this morning. Um, I looked at Hebrews, um, thought, well, well, we'll go a little different direction. Um, it's always good, it's always good, and Hebrews would have drawn our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ as well and, and to his power. It's always good to look at the Lord and his power and his provision for us. And that's, Psalm 104 does that marvelously. It shows us that the power of God in his provision, as, as creator and as provider, both. And there's some great pictures in this uh, psalm. So let's read the whole psalm together. Uh, psalm 104 starts out as Psalm 103 ends with, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the winds, wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers, a flame of fire. You who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever, you covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the voice of your thunder they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them, the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hill, hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, where the birds make their nests. The stork has her home in the fruit trees. The high hills are for the wild goats, the cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun knows it's going down. You make darkness, and it is night, in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar after their prey, and they seek their food from God. Mm. When the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions, this great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great. There the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan which you have made to play there. These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth, and it trembles. He touches the hills, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will, praise, I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. May sinners be consumed from the earth, and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for everything that we've read of here in this psalm, your provision for us, uh, your great power, your great plan for your creation, your great plan for man. Lord, be with us as we look into your word. Again, we pray for those who are uh, struggling and uh, dealing with illness this morning. Uh, we pray, Lord, uh, for the hellers that they'll quickly recover their strength. We pray for others that are still dealing with uh, after effects. Uh, we pray for our sister Jane, help her with, uh, to recover from her surgery. Uh, Lord, uh, just be with us again. Lift us up, encourage us, uh, draw us closer to yourself, direct us to your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, what a marvelous, what a marvelous
marvelous record the Lord has given us here in this psalm. And if you want to look at it in, in this uh, sense, you can. This is a summary and more of a poetic telling of Genesis chapter 1. Um, verse 1, where it talks about the light, could be a, a, a telling of day 1, where the Lord created light. Day, uh, the second half of verse 2 down to verse 4 would be day 2. Uh, verses 5, uh, really down through about um, 18, that whole section kind of talks about day 3 of creation. Uh, starting in verse 19, day 4, uh, in verse 21, day 6, gets a little out of order. Verse 25, talking about the sea, the, 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 the fish of the sea were created on day 5. And then he comes back to talk more about day 6 in verse 27 and following, and then he has some closing thoughts. So that's one framework you can think about this psalm in, and it, it, it helps us as we read through it to understand what the, the psalmist is trying to get us to understand. Um, it is not identified in the Hebrew text who the author of this psalm is. Uh, psalm 103 is a psalm of David. That's how it's identified. Uh, in some of the versions, it may say, depending on what version you're reading from, it may say this is a psalm of David. Most are just going to leave it anonymous. But um, one idea that it might be David, A, the language that is used, and B, the tying together of that idea of bless the Lord, O oh my soul, follow, flowing from 103 right into 104. They may have been, when they were first written, they may have been one word. Uh, remember, the, the chapter divisions and everything, and then verse divisions, those were something that were added much later, not, not when the, uh, the, the psalmist originally wrote these. So they could be all one thought because both of them talk about the greatness of God. 103 is the greatness of God in salvation. 104 is the greatness of God in creation and in the provision for those of us, his creatures. I do like the beginning. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, makes it very personal. Lord, my God, you are very great. If we wanted, we say this quite often up here, some, some of us will say it. If we wanted to stop right there, we stop, sit down. The Lord has spoken to us. Lord, you are very great. And we just ponder that for a while and think about that. Think about how great the Lord is. But then the psalmist, he didn't stop there. He could have stopped there as well. The Lord directed him to continue on. He continues on. Lord, why are you so great? Because of all these reasons we're going to look at. Um, you are clothed with honor and majesty. Talking about the comparison of the Lord as king to an earthly king. Okay, his clothing is not earthly raiment. He's clothed in glory and honor. You cover yourself with light as with a garment. Thinking about what the Lord is clothed in. You stretch out the heavens like a curtain. Think how easily we reach out and we pull a curtain. Uh, there's no effort to that. That was how easy it was for the Lord to form the heavens. He stretched out the heavens like a curtain. This gives us some idea of the immensity of his power and the immensity of his creation. We look up at the heavens and we see a very limited amount. We, we can use telescopes and other things to see more of what's there. Um, but... It's, it's immeasurable, the size of, and the scope of the universe. You stretch out the heavens like a curtain, both the heavens that we dwell in, the birds dwell in, that the airplanes fly in, and that the stars are in, those heavens all being part of that. You stretch out the heavens like a curtain. Think of setting up a tent curtain as well, something we do without, without a whole lot of effort. We set up a tent. The Lord, his dwelling, what he made for himself, the heavens, the heaven of heavens, just like us setting up a tent. To him, he stretched out everything we see, the immensity of it, and it was no effort. And he spoke it with a word, and it stretched out. And if you want to get into some of the, the, the scientific details behind it, the heavens are still stretching. Okay? The heavens are still expanding. There's an expanding element to the heavens, and that's due to the Lord's work at creation. Talks a little bit about Again, the, the imagery of his house. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. That would be the waters above the earth. He makes the clouds his chariot. Kings, Earthly kings ride in a chariot. The Lord, again, is above the clouds and above the heavens. And the picture there is, is how high and exalted he is. And he doesn't need an earthly chariot with chariot wheels and horses to, to move about. 
but he makes the clouds his chariots. They're, they're his servants. He walks on the wings of the wind. He makes his angels spirits, his ministers, a flame of fire. Great imagery there. Great imagery as we think about the Lord's power and the Lord's heaven and where the Lord dwells. Okay. He doesn't literally walk on the wing, wings of the wind. He doesn't literally ride on the clouds like a chariot. But it's the picture that the psalmist is getting at. Get your eyes off of this earth. Look up to the heavens where God dwells. Get your eyes lifted up, and, and he is exalted. Then we come to day three, if you will, in verse five. You, the Lord, who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. So the, the earth is fixed in its orbit. The earth moves. A lot of things have happened in this world and over time, and then the earth continues unabated in its orbit, in its path. The sun, sun moon, and stars appear in their orbits. Everything is as the Lord designed from the beginning. He set them, he laid the foundations, but yet Job tells us that he hangs the earth on nothing. Mm -hmm. So a couple of ideas there though, right? The earth is firmly founded. We think of a foundation as a firm founding that doesn't move. And then that fact though, when you look at the earth, if you go out into space and you take a picture of the earth, it literally does hang on nothing. There's nothing supporting the earth. The ancients thought that it was supported on the back of elephants, or turtles on the backs of elephants, or on a, a true pillar, sitting on a pillar, like they would see in the Roman temples. He does literally hang the earth on nothing. And it continues to work as he designed it. Looking again at, at the, the early creation, you covered it with the deep, as with a garment, as when the earth was, was uh, wrapped in water. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke, at the word of the Lord, the waters fled, but the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. This is when he would divide the waters and the dry land on day two. Where did the waters go? Well, they were up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you founded for them. They, they returned to the place that the Lord had designed for them. Um, it's not random hydrological patterns and everything else that make the, the waters flow on the earth. It's the Lord's doing. He, he established some of the, 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 the geology and the hydrology and the rain cycle, all the things that we see. He established all that, mm -hmm. but he maintains it by his power, and it works because he has his influence still upon it. If he were to release his control over individual atoms, those individual atoms would explode and this world would be gone. In an instant. Okay. He holds the atoms together. It's by his power that they exist. They talk about the strong nuclear force and some other things that hold things together, but you get just a little bit away from the inside of that atom, that strong nuclear force isn't strong anymore. It's the Lord's power holding that atom together. Okay. There, there's, there's, there's things happening there. There's pluses and minuses and different things going on, positives and negatives. But the Lord, in his power, maintains that and sustains that. That's not a simplistic view, right? That is not a simplistic view. That is the truth. Mm -hmm. That's how it really works, okay? Because you ask any physicist, what really holds the atoms together? Well, we call it the strong nuclear force, but we don't understand what it is. <coughs> the atoms are bound together. All things consist by his power from Colossians. Uh, you have set a boundary, this is talking about the water, set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. Okay? So the waters, they have a boundary, the seas are bound. There was one time when that was not true at the flood. Okay? The floods again came and covered the earth. Okay? That's only happened once and the Lord promises there's never going to be a time when the earth will be covered for the flood. Local floods still happen. Rivers overflow their banks. Things happen. I got to thinking about some of the, the aspects of climate change, global warming, and rising oceans, and all of these things. The Lord says, I've set a boundary for the waters. The waters are not going to overflow the boundaries that I have set. Okay. Again, maybe that's a simplistic explanation, but it's the truth. The Lord says, I keep the waters where I want them. Man is pretty arrogant to think that we can change the climate. We don't change the climate. No matter what we do, we don't change the climate. 
The Lord is in control of the climate. The Lord's in control of all things. He has set a boundary for the waters. Those waters are going to remain where the Lord wants them to remain. <clears throat> Excuse me. He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. We're in verse 10. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. One, uh, one commentator that I was reading says, when was the last time you even thought about a wild donkey or a wild horse or whatever it might be, a wild animal? We don't a lot of times think about them. The Lord feeds and waters them continually. Mm -hmm. The Lord takes care of them. Mm -hmm. Talking about the springs and the waters and the, and the wild donkeys, they, they drink there. The birds of the air make their nests there. The Lord has provided for them. When you look out and you, you go up in the mountains and you see springs flowing, you see rivers, you see waters, you see all kinds of things that the Lord is doing with the waters. The waters are there. They flow at the Lord's command. He makes the rain to fall. He replenishes the springs and the waters. And he cares for the beasts of the field. Why is that important? Why is it important that we understand that he waters the wild donkeys and the birds of the air make their nests there? Why is that important? If he cares about the wild beasts of the field, he cares immensely more for you and I. Amen. Immensely more. Okay? Talking in Matthew, it talks about the sparrows falling, and he gives the birds of the air. They don't, they have one master that feeds them, and that's the Lord. The Lord does that for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. How much more does he care for us and love us? Specifically, in providing eternal life for us. That's how he, that's how he shows his immensity of his love for us. You know, the kids here, a lot of them, they probably think, well, my food comes from Walmart. I go to the store, I pick it up off the shelf, that's where my food comes from. And that's the end of the chain. That's where, that's where the food ends up <coughs> on the shelf. Where did that food start? That food started in the field, growing because God allowed it to grow. Think of a seed. It's dead. You put that seed in the ground and it grows. From that seed comes food for us. That only happens because God makes it happen. I can't make the seed grow. I can put the seed in the ground. Farmers can put the seed in the ground. They can't make it grow. I was talking to one of our customers, and he's a big farmer, and he, he thinks he's got all kinds of tremendous ideas, and he's trying to increase his yields. So crops a lot of times are planted in, in certain distances apart in the fields. And he said, well, if I take and I plant a row in between those rows, I'm going to increase my yield. Yeah, you did. But who still made that seed sprout when you put it in the ground? You had the idea to put more seed in the ground. That's all you did. You didn't make more. You just put more in the ground. The Lord gave the increase of that. But I thought that was, you know, that, that's interesting. How the Lord causes everything to happen. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. That's the rain that falls. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. The earth is satisfied by the Lord's works. Okay? We get the benefit of that at times. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man. That's what we're talking about. He makes the vegetation grow. He makes the plants grow. He makes the crops grow. Man puts them in the ground, tends them, harvests them. But man cannot make that seed sprout. Okay? That is truly the power of the Lord that makes the seed sprout. He gives life to something that has really no life in it. There's potential life there, but the Lord has to make it come out. He may, that he may bring forth food from the earth. So the, the Lord, again, is the source of all food that we have. And we need to think about that. We need to consider that, that the Lord gives us our food. It's real easy to get complacent and think, I can just run to the store and get it. Well, yeah, now we can it's nice to be able to go in and have that convenience. That hasn't always been the case. You know, going to the store is a fairly re recent event. You know, within the last couple of hundred, 200, 300 years, right before that, you, know, you grew your stuff. You, maybe you went to a trader to get it. But there was a lot more close connection to the earth and a much more realization that my daily survival comes from the Lord. We're so far removed from that, it's not even funny. 
He gives us wine that makes glad the heart of man, so there's grapes that grow in the field. He gives oil from olive trees, and then he gives bread that strengthens man's heart. And in the Oriental world, those were the three basic things that you had at any feast. So you'd have wine, because the water maybe wasn't fit to drink. You'd have wine, you'd have olive oil, other olive products, and you'd have bread. And bread is also just kind of a generic term for food. So, but the Lord provided all those things. He makes them grow. We saw olive trees growing in, in groves and groves and groves and groves and groves as we were in Israel. We saw how you take that olive and crush it, get the olive oil out of it. Okay? But the Lord still makes, each year by year, okay, man just tends it. He watches the olive tree, the olives come, they get harvested, the tree looks dead, the leaves fall. Next, next fall or next spring, whenever the high, I think it's probably, we were there, they were budding then, I think it's in the fall. The fruit's back on the tree. Okay? Man got the benefit of God's handiwork in that olive tree, or in the grapevine, or in the field. Okay? The one part man plays there is, again, he plants it. All right? He plants it. The trees of the Lord are full of sap. In, in my Bible here, the of sap is in italic. That means it was added, but it completes the thought. The trees of the Lord are full of sap. The cedars of Lebanon, which he planted. Okay? Man didn't plant the cedars of Lebanon. That wasn't planted in man's hand. Literally, that was the Lord's work in making that grow. Whether it came from the seeds that fall from tree and another tree grows and, and all that happens. But man, man didn't plant the cedars of Lebanon. That was definitely the Lord. The birds make their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The stork is an interesting word. I did, I did not know this. But you think about a stork. And, and what's one of the things that the stork does? Well, when, when a baby's born... There's, there's pictures of storks. <laughs> storks don't bring the babies, but okay, sorry to, to burst your bubble. If you thought that was true, Jim, if you thought that's how it happened, I'm, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. <laughs> but the immense care of the stork for its young versus a lot of other birds, the stork takes great care to take care of its young. That's how I think that, that picture and that legend got started. The stork loves its children more so than a lot of birds. A lot of birds, they just go, you're on your own, go for it. But the stork gives great care to its young. And the word that, that is used there for stork in the Hebrew is a, is a derivative of hesed, which is the word for loving kindness. Mm -hmm. That word for stork there. It's a beautiful picture. A beautiful picture of the, 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 the stork caring for its young. The Lord's loving kindness. Because he, he could have chosen a lot of different birds to put in there. And, and he's talking bigger birds that build in the bigger trees. He could have chosen some other names, but he chose stork because of the care of the stork for its young and the idea of the Lord's loving kindness for us. I thought that was a great thought. It's a great thought. The high hills are for the wild goats, and the cliffs are a refuge. New King James says the rock badgers. I think King James says conies. Okay? That little animal is a, is a hyrax. And it looks like a big, kind of a, a rabbit, but it's a rabbit that has cloven hooves. There's little cloven hooves on the, on the feet. So it's a small animal, but it's a, it's a mammal. It, uh, it has sharp teeth like a, a squirrel or a rabbit, but then it has little cloven hooves. So it's kind of an interesting little beast. But that's the, the animal, one of the animals he talks about there. The cliffs are a refuge and the high hills for the wild goats. So again, we saw wild goats on the hills. When we were in Israel, if you go to En Gedi, the, it's still there where David went. David talked about, in another psalm, the goats on the hills at En Gedi. You could see them there, and we saw them when we were at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. There was a goat in one of the caves. I was able to get a picture of that goat from half a mile away. The Lord had to be good there because the, the picture just came out great. But that little goat, that little hyrax was standing there in that cave and we were able to get a picture of that. But you can see that picture clear as day. The high hills truly are covered by wild goats. And the cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. The Lord puts the hills and the cliffs there for their habitat and he protects them. They're made and they're designed to work well in that habitat. They can climb. I don't know how that goat got up there, but it climbed up that hill and was up there in that cave. 
Okay? Because the Lord enabled it, gives it the, the ability to, to do that. So we've got through the first three days, day one, two, and three. Day four, on um, the day four, the Lord created the sun, moon, and the stars. Notice the order of what he describes here. He starts with the moon. He has appointed the moon for a season. We tend to put the importance on the sun. The psalmist puts the emphasis first on the moon, and then the sun knows it's going down. You make darkness, and in this night, in which all beasts of the forest creep about. There's some thoughts among some scholars that, that Psalm 104 came from a hymn that was written by a one of the pharaohs. So an Egyptian pharaoh wrote a hymn to the sun god. So, again, some of the more liberal scholars would say, well, well, the psalmist must have, must have read that and, and copied that and came up with that idea. Well, if, if the psalmist had any knowledge or was even trying to address that, he was addressing how false the idea is of the sun god. Right? We don't worship the sun. We worship the one who made the sun. Okay? The Egyptian pharaoh was worshiping the disc of the sun as he saw in the sky. That was his god. That's who he was worshiping. So even in the word order here, the moon comes first. He gives the moon first and then talks about the sun. And if you read through um, Genesis 1, what's the order? Evening and morning were the days. So the night was first. The moon was first in that order. So he gives us a little hint there that maybe he is definitely going through the days of creation. But he appointed the moon for seasons. Okay? For the Hebrew calendar, a lot of things on the Hebrew calendar happened on either a new moon or a full moon. So the moon was definitely what their calendar was based on. Okay? We have a more of a solar calendar. Theirs was a lunar calendar. Month by month by month, they would watch the, the changes of the moon. That would be where they came up with their calendar. So that would be the idea of the seasons. The sun... Knows it's going down. Now, how would you like it if your God disappeared every day? And is he going to come back tomorrow? That's a, it's an interesting thought, right? I worship this sun disk, but every day he disappears. And I don't know if he's coming back tomorrow. We know the one who put the sun there is there forever and will never leave us or forsake us. Right? We don't worship, again, we don't worship the sun God or the moon God. We worship the one who created them. But the sun, he personifies it a little bit. The sun knows it's going down. The sun is directed. The, the, the earth rotates and the sun rises and sets each day. But he gives the idea that the sun, and it is, the sun is under the control of the God of the universe. He knows its place. You make darkness, and it is night. The Lord does that. In which all the beasts of the forest creep about. Talks about the young lions roaring and seeking their food from God. So the king of the beasts, the king of the beasts gets his food from God. God provides for the king of the beasts. God will also provide for the pinnacle of his creation, man. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. A special creation. That was a great idea. I'd never noticed that as I looked at that before. The, the whole idea they seek their food from God. Okay. Powerful beasts, a lion. Powerful beast, but he gets his hand, food comes to his hand, his paw from God, just like our food comes to us. Then when the sun rises, the beasts of the night gather together and they lay it down in their dens. And then man comes out during the day. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening, and then the cycle repeats. So each day there's a, a day and a night. There's creatures that come out at night, man comes out in the daytime. Uh, evil men, perhaps, come out at night. Mm. Perhaps. O Lord, and then he just interjects this. O Lord, how manifold, how, how many are your works? In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Okay, not just a little bit. The earth is full of your possessions. Everything in the earth is the Lord's. And then we'll, we'll uh, hurry here and finish this up. The great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things. That would be day five of creation. Living things, both small and great. You have the largest mammal, the largest animal in the world lives in the ocean, a whale. And then you have some of the, the microscopic plankton that the whale eats. So the things the whale eat, we might not even see. He strains it out with, with what the Lord's provided for him. Certain whales, other whales eat living other things. 
Um, the ships sail about, so man can't just go out into the water and, and, and go very far. He's got to have a ship to sail about on it. There is that Leviathan, which you have made to play there. Okay. Again, some of the ancients had an idea of the sea monsters that lived beyond the edge of the world. Okay. And the edge of the world to the, the Hebrews was basically the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. That was pretty much the edge of the world. Hmm. Because the, the Israelites weren't a seagoing people. They had some ships under Solomon and some things, but they weren't really a seagoing people. So there's, there, you know, if you've seen some of the, the pirate movies, there'd be monsters that live there, right? That's what, that was their thought. They were, they were afraid of what lie beyond the sea, of the, lie beyond the, the land. But the Lord is saying, even if Leviathan is there, even if a sea monster is there, he's just one of my playthings. He's under my control as well as everything else. You don't have to be afraid of what lives in the sea or what lives in the forest. All those things are under my control. which you have made to play there. These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. So again, that idea of the Lord controlling, feeding, providing. You give them their food when it's necessary. You give them their food in due season. They wait for you. Lord, we wait for you as well. We wait upon you. We wait for your guidance. We wait for your direction. We wait for our provision from you. Another thought that I had, and one thing I was reading, talking about the sea, the vastness of the sea. So basically the idea was the psalmist had his hand stretched out wide. He said, well, that's as wide as I can go, but the, the ocean, the sea is much wider than that. I can't really comprehend how wide the sea is. The surface of the earth, 70% of it's covered with water. Okay. Water vapor plays a huge part in the climate. Okay. So one of the ideas is... Okay. So man-created climate change comes from all the carbon dioxide and all the stuff we're putting in the air. That's, that's man-made climate change. Again, we think we can have that effect. Water vapor is much more important. The water vapor, part of it is self-regulating. So water goes up, it evaporates, and it cools the atmosphere. The water gets too hot, more water bubbles up, goes up, cools the atmosphere even further. There's a self-regulation there in the water and the water vapor and that part of the climate. Okay? We don't do anything to change that. Again, the water comes from God. God's hand is on the climate. So, just a, one little interesting thing I read about the whole climate issue. <clears throat> you hide your face, they are troubled. Okay? When, we, when we feel the Lord is not near, we are troubled. You take away their breath, they die. Okay? Again, our very breath is controlled by the breath of the Lord. This is talking more about the beast, but it applies to us as well. And they return. You send forth your spirit, they are created. Those animals are created by the spirit of the Lord. And you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. May the Lord rejoice in his works. We rejoice in his works. But it also says the Lord rejoices in his works. Specifically, on the days of creation, he looked at each day and said, it is good. But the Lord rejoices in his works. The Lord glories in his works. We glory in the works of the Lord. He looks on the earth and it trembles. Perhaps a reference to earthquakes. Again, it just takes a look from the Lord. Okay. And here in Wichita recently, back around between uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, there were you know, scores of earthquakes here. None of them really severe, but there was a bunch of earthquakes. Now they're gone. I haven't been here for a while. The Lord looks and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. Also possibly the idea of a volcano. Okay. Again, forces under the earth, geology, all the things that go on subterranean in the subterranean world. But the Lord is in control of all that too. We don't see it, or very seldom we see it, but it, it definitely takes place. We, uh, back in September, October, we were in Montana, Wyoming, we got to go to Yellowstone. We got to see some of the marvels of God's creation in Yellowstone. Okay? Beasts of the field that the Lord had created. Saw a bear, saw an elk, saw some of the things that were there. Saw the Grand Canyon that the Yellowstone River flows in. Okay? There again, the work of the Lord in forming that as the waters rushed away. Not, not billions and billions of years of evolution, but the Lord's work in doing that. Okay? But there's all throughout that park, there's places where there's just steam vents venting 
We saw one venting out of the side of a mountain. It used to be a lot louder. They said in, in 100 years ago, this one that we stopped and looked at, you could hear it miles away. It wasn't that loud when we saw it, but there was steam venting out of the earth. Okay? The hand of the Lord, the Lord is in control, and the mountain smoke. Literally, there was smoke and steam coming from the mountains. Another sp spot was called the mouth of the dragon. And there was continual noise coming from that cavern of the steam and everything that was going on back and behind there. It, it sounded like a roar coming out of that cave. Mud pots bubbling, different things. Okay? The power of the Lord just being manifested for us to see. Now, when you see it, what do you think? Oh, that's cool. Or, Lord, how marvelous are your works and your very love and care for us. Okay? Um, I was just, I mean, I was just overwhelmed with the, the, the beauty and the majesty of what was there. Right? The mountains, the rivers. You know, being able to, to, to fish for trout in the Yellowstone River, that was awesome, right? But the Lord put that there. Luke and I spent an afternoon on the banks of the Yellowstone River, playing with rocks or fishing or whatever it was that we were doing. All because of God's handiwork. And it's there for us to enjoy. Amen. And it, if we were really hungry, we could have eaten the trout we caught. It would barely have fed both of us, but if we'd have been really hungry, it would have fed us, right? He would have provided for us. Maybe it, I'd probably lost the battle if, if Luke and I had fought over the trout. He would probably have won. So, but but he does that for us. He does that for us. And if he feeds us and provides our shelter and our everything else, does he not care about your soul? That's what he cares about. That's what really what the, the, the psalmist would, I think would be pointing us to. The Lord cares for his creation. He made it. He formed it. Don't worship the creation. Worship the one beyond the creation. And think of the care, okay, for again, for a coney, okay, a little rabbit, or for a little bird. Think of the Lord's care for that. That's awesome. The Lord does that. How much more does he care for you, his creation, made in his image? And it doesn't say that about the beasts, that they're made in the Lord's image. We are made in the image of God. That God then provided a way of salvation for us. He will not leave us forsaken. He will not leave us destitute. The Lord is good. Um, I will be glad in the Lord from verse 34. Again, we can get caught up in a lot of stuff, but I'll be glad in the Lord. Okay? Be glad in the Lord. And then he ends as he did at the beginning of the verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah is the, the, the word that would be used there. And from, from what I can read, from what I understand, that's the first place in the psalm that, that hallelujah comes out. There's other words where it says praise, bless, but that phrase in the Hebrew, hallelujah, praise to God, praise the Lord, that's the first place it comes out. So, and uh, again, at a great end of a psalm talking about creation, his provision, his protection, all those things for us, the psalmist, all he can say at the end of that is praise the Lord. Okay? What do we do when we see the Lord's provision for us? What do we say? Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, praise his holy name. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are merciful and powerful. Lord, we love you. We're glad that you love us.